Greetings, gentlemen. Do the cheaters deserve to be punished, or will karma do its own thing? What do you think? Let's listen to stories about adultery. On Thursday, Bob sat down at the table, his gaze riveted on the bottle of Miller Lite in front of him. He decided to take only six bottles, realizing that he did not want to get too drunk if the situation suddenly took a different turn. When the music stopped upstairs, he realized that his wife had almost finished packing her things. Bob usually worked late on Thursdays because his wife and her friends had hen parties. His parents would pick up their daughter, Casey, and his wife would go out for a drink with colleagues. At this time, Bob stayed at work, doing paperwork so that he could leave early on Friday and be with his family. Everything seemed to have been carefully planned. He found time in his busy work schedule, his parents enjoyed tinkering with their granddaughter, and his wife enjoyed socializing with friends. At least, that's what he thought. When his wife went to the bathroom, he remembered having lunch with Vicky last Tuesday. He thought about how delicious their sandwiches were and decided that he needed to go to the store more often or explore delivery options. Crouching down so as not to lose sight of the door, he noticed a familiar figure entering the restaurant. Bob stood up and waved. She noticed him and walked towards him. At 31, Vicky was the oldest of Bob's wife's ex-girlfriends. Bob liked her, especially since she was the only one who was already married. Vicky had a special ability to smooth things out without annoying. Bob couldn't deny that her dark wavy hair and fair skin made her very attractive. Although she wasn't the best at chess, her beauty and long legs more than made up for it. Vicky's husband, Ron, considered her a blessing from above, and Bob couldn't disagree with him. Sitting across from him, she expressed her gratitude to Bob for taking the time to meet. I know you're very busy, Bob, so I appreciate you taking the time for me, she said, meeting his gaze. Bob nodded his thanks. No problem, Vicky, he replied. But I have to admit that meeting without Sharon seems a little strange to me. I usually prefer to have lunch with my wife, but when it comes to something related to Sharon, I'm all attention. I suppose you're planning to surprise her for her birthday next month. Bob was stunned by the sadness he saw in Vicky's eyes when it came to their lunch and Sharon's birthday. Bob, I see that you and Sharon love each other. It's undeniable. I've seen enough to know how strong your relationship is. That's why I'm here. Maybe our friendship will end, but if it means saving your marriage, I'm ready. Sharon has been dating someone for two months. Bob was shocked. It must be a joke and a very scary one, he told Vicky. I'm sorry, Bob, but this is very serious. Ever since you started working on this project three months ago, Sharon has been feeling depressed. She was sullen at work and showed no interest when we went out. After a few drinks, she confessed that she misses you and feels neglected. According to her, it seems to her that you are just fulfilling your duties as a middle-aged spouse, letting life slip away. At that moment, the waiter came to take Vicky's order, and she chose a cob salad and tea with lemon and ice. Bob's thoughts were preoccupied with his wife's silence. Throughout the eight years of marriage, I was sure that she would always trust him if she was unhappy. They were always open and honest with each other, even when they disagreed. Turning to Vicky, he urgently asked in a whisper, did she sleep with him? Vicky replied, as far as I know, no. Your wife is usually very open about everything. That's why I'm surprised by her behavior. Bob, there's something you should know. All the women I talked to expressed similar feelings. I can assume that both of you often talk about feeling overwhelmed by the demands of everyday life, Vicky explained. When Sharon mentioned this, we all sympathized with her and said that she is a wonderful woman who deserves more attention from you. Unfortunately, my sister was there that night. What does your sister have to do with this? Bob asked, barely able to contain his anger. The waiter serving her tea raised an eyebrow. Vicky took a sip before continuing. Our parents were unfaithful to each other although I do not know which of them cheated first. Their relationship was filled with a desire to take revenge on each other. When I was 17, I wondered why they were staying together, but they brushed me off, saying their love was all that mattered. This situation has affected my sister and me in different ways. I thought cheating ruined relationships, whereas my sister thought it was acceptable if there was love. I love her, but she's deluded. My sister Gail, advised them to look for love outside of a relationship if she couldn't find it at home. I disagreed with her, but then Hannah and Gail started talking about finding a new partner and hiding it. I suppose they discussed it hypothetically, especially since they are not married. Sharon said she would never change, but I'm afraid that her sister's words might have raised doubts in her. 
Why do you think that? Bob asked. Not being sure of Sharon's loyalty, he began to analyze the situation further. Although the information revealed to him was difficult to digest, Bob firmly believed in the importance of knowledge. The following week, Luke Jonas and his team showed up at the Red Horse Bar. Sharon insisted that she had not invited him, but mentioned plans for a group dance. Although it's usually nice when more people join new events, but not in the presence of Luke. After learning the name, Bob realized the truth of the saying. Knowledge is power. Vicky noticed Bob's confident manner, chuckled slightly, and continued. Luke Jonas has a reputation for stalking women. He is actively looking for every woman, showing interest in anyone who succumbs to his charm. He makes no distinction based on marital status or attractiveness, but simply enjoys the excitement of the chase. Your wife caught his attention earlier, but he didn't pursue her until tonight. Now he is actively pursuing her, and she, instead of confronting him, prefers to avoid him. It is widely known that if Luke is accused of another inappropriate harassment, he will be fired from his position. Despite the possibility of ending his courtship, she prefers not to do so. In the last few months, they have often been seen talking in the cafeteria. When I tried to bring up the subject, she became defensive, claiming that they were just friends and that Luke was a good listener who understood her problems. I asked her if she would behave the same way if you were around, and she blushed, admitting that she wouldn't. Then she got upset, mentioning that she felt unnoticed by you. After that, I stepped aside and began to watch her closely. Everything seemed to calm down at work, and I thought everything was back to normal until that event happened three weeks ago. When the food arrived, Vicky began to eat. Bob, watching her closely, took a sip of lemonade. His mind was occupied with other things. He couldn't understand why she thought he would be bothered by her flirting with another man. He knew that he did not feel an excessive sense of possessiveness because he fully believed and loved his wife. Reflecting on the fact that he hadn't been paying attention to her, he wondered if he was getting too carried away with his work project. In the end, he will receive a substantial reward, but perhaps he has gone too far. The incident that happened three weeks ago continues to haunt him with curiosity. Is he ready to get to the truth? Bob and Vicky sat in silence for the next five minutes, giving him a chance to digest her revelations. Undoubtedly, he was upset. She had no excuse for such a close relationship with another man. And yet, to some extent, he could understand her reasoning. If he had been more attentive, perhaps this situation could have been avoided. By not revealing her flirtatious actions, she was, in fact, deceiving him. Ignoring her lies, he decided to sort out the situation and talk to her about what was bothering him. If she was honest, and wanted to distance herself from Luke, they could solve this problem. He was sure they could handle it if nothing serious had happened in the last three weeks. With this attitude, he gained a sense of stability and was ready to cope with whatever happened. Vicky looked at him sympathetically. That's where things take a turn for the worse, Bob, she said. Three weeks ago, we found ourselves back at the Red Horse Bar to dance. Luke and his buddies came over and we had a great time dancing together. Sharon drank more than usual and Luke constantly bought her drinks, as a result of which she became very drunk. I took her to the bathroom and saw that she was even more intoxicated than I expected. When she came out of the toilet, she clutched her underwear in her hand, saying that she wanted to feel free, being already drunk. I attributed her actions to alcohol and escorted her back to our table. I tried to convince Hannah and Gail to help me take Sharon to my place, so that she would not return home in a state of severe intoxication. But my attention was attracted by Sharon and Luke, who were comfortably sitting, bumping into each other, and playfully imitating intimate actions on the dance floor. After the group dancing ended, the rest of the night seemed blurry to me. I saw Sharon put the laundry in Luke's pocket when the song ended, to everyone's amusement at the bar. Luke smiled broadly and leaned in for a passionate kiss. A friend captured this moment on his phone, I wanted Sharon to refuse, but she agreed. When she saw Bob's reaction, she apologized and said she was very sorry. His mouth was open in shock, which made him apologize and go to the toilet. Stuttering, he shut himself inside to collect his thoughts. As he splashed water on his face and held onto the sink tightly, he was flooded with memories of the night when Sharon returned home late again, this time at 2.30 a.m., after Vicky called and said she would stay with her because of excessive alcohol consumption, which happened more than once. Bob was always grateful to Vicky and the girls for not letting Sharon drive drunk. Remembering how intense their intimacy had been that evening, 
He noticed a change in her behavior, felt betrayed by her apparent arousal for another man, and anticipated conflict when he returned home. What if she was thinking about him while we were together? He asked himself a question. Gathering his strength, he returned to the table, noticing the sympathy in Vicky's expression, but not knowing how to react. The untouched sandwich lay in front of him as he pressed for details. Vicky simply replied, Honestly, Bob, that's it. The last bachelorette parties were at Hannah's. Vicky noticed that Sharon seemed to have distanced herself from Luke, despite the fact that he continued to pursue her. As soon as Vicky thought that their relationship was over, she saw that they were talking just yesterday. Their conversation ended abruptly when she approached, leaving Vicky unaware of what was really going on between them. I thought you should know because she doesn't listen to her friends anymore, Vicky explained when the waiter brought the bill. Bob quickly grabbed it, groping for his credit card. I would like to observe their communication, he suggested. This week, you ladies will go to the Red Square Bar. On Thursday, when you go, I'll be watching them from the sidelines, he said, and suddenly stopped when he noticed the worried expression on Vicky's face. What did I say wrong? Bob asked. Vicky explained, Hannah has to go to the doctor on Friday morning, and Gail is going to her brother's in Florida. If Sharon comes out on Thursday, we won't be with her. Vicky reached across the table and took my hand. I'm so sorry, darling, she said bitterly. I know it's probably not the best idea to ask how you're doing, but here's my home phone. Call me anytime to talk to Ron or me, Vicky suggested. Her husband was a marriage counselor, so talking to him might be helpful. Thank you for telling me about this, Vicky. I know it was hard for you, but I truly believe that you are a good woman and a good friend. I do not know what the future holds for us, but I am aware of the current situation and can take some steps. Thanks again. Bob expressed his gratitude, paid the bill, and left. Today was an important milestone in Bob's project. They successfully secured the supply of finished parts from a startup company from Harrisburg. This achievement not only reduced the preparation time for work by two months, but also guaranteed at least a week's supply, despite problems with unstable transport logistics. Two more phone calls, and the whole plan could have been completed two months ahead of schedule, which would have saved the military millions of dollars. In addition, Bob was counting on a substantial cash bonus and an improved reputation due to the success of the project. He should have been happy, like a cat full of cream. But instead, he thought about how he didn't want to go home and solve problems that he knew needed to be solved. Deciding to get to the bottom of it, he decided to take matters into his own hands. Although he didn't have access to her work email, he was skeptical that they were using it to communicate, as the HR department was monitoring it. He tried logging into her Yahoo mail, but found nothing suspicious. Perhaps she had a secret account that he could only find out about by logging into their home computer. Bob admitted his ignorance of technology, realizing that the idea of buying security cameras or installing voice-controlled microphones looks attractive in theory. Despite this, he developed a plan. His goal was to gather as much information as possible to assess the efforts needed to save or end a marriage. Sharon had already taken their daughter Casey from her parents and asked him to deliver Chinese food. When he asked how she felt, she replied that after 10 years of marriage and 8 years of married life, he should already know that she loved him. Bob couldn't resist retorting sarcastically that he just wanted to make sure she was still happy with everything. Sharon asked for an extra dish. If it wasn't for the explosive news, he would have been glad to return home early and spend time with his wife and child. Glancing at his watch, he was still in shock. He realized that, according to the project, this hour should have come two hours later. It dawned on him that he hadn't been home with his family so early on Friday since the start of the project. Fatigue and stress helped him realize that Sharon might feel left out, even though it didn't justify her actions. Entering through the front door, he saw his wife reaching for a bottle of wine. He paused, admiring her figure. At 31, she was the epitome of femininity. She was just over five feet tall, and her curves were seductive even in loose sweatpants. After tying her hair into a ponytail, she turned to him, giving him a radiant smile, and he felt incredibly lucky to have her. But then reality caught up with him. I'm so glad you're home, honey. How's work going? She went up to him and kissed him on the lips. Very good. We have managed to achieve a significant breakthrough in supplies, so we will be able to finish the project at least a month ahead of schedule. My love, I realize that I've been away from home a lot lately because of this project. 
I wish I could share all the details because they are classified, but please know that you and Casey are my top priorities, and I will do everything to ensure our safety, he assured, looking deeply into her eyes. Was there a hint of regret or guilt in her gaze, or is she just thinking too much? He often cursed his inability to read people, preferring straightforward communication. He believed in honesty and unscrupulousness, and this method served him well for 34 years. He saw no reason to change it now. Oh, my dear, she replied, we both love you and understand. I wish you were around more often, but I know it's temporary. Still, I appreciate your recognition. She seemed close to tears. Was she really touched, or was she just putting on a show? And how will completing the project as soon as possible help you? She asked, taking food containers out of her bag. First of all, it means that a significant bonus will be added to my salary. The exact amount has not yet been determined before the approval of the project, but it is definitely not small. In addition, the successful completion of our first government project may bring additional orders to the company. As a project manager, I can offer lucrative opportunities to government contractors who need my help. If everything goes according to plan, it can be very profitable, he clarified, trying to eat sweet and sour pork with chopsticks, and then switching to a fork. Didn't I say this before? he asked between bites. As far as I remember, no, my dear, she replied. All I remember is that you were talking about some important contract that was classified, but sounded promising. It looks like we haven't talked since then, she said with a slight sadness, but immediately brightened up. But it looks like my husband will be back soon, she added in an even brighter tone. He looked at her. So which bar are you ladies going to tomorrow night? Maybe I should stop by after work to make sure you're okay and can go home? he asked in a casual manner. Actually, we decided to go to the Red Horse Bar to dance with friends, but I think we'll finish before you finish work, she replied. Just at this time, Casey finished her egg roll and asked her father to tell her bedtime stories. He put the plate away, rinsed it in the sink, and then picked up his daughter and carried her into the living room. For the next hour, he read her story after story until she fell asleep. There was a soft snoring from the sofa, and he saw his wife curled up with a book on her lap. Carefully taking his daughter in his arms, he went upstairs to put her to bed. He carefully put his daughter to bed, making sure that she was comfortably ensconced under the covers. When he thought about the difficulties they would have to face the next day, tears welled up in his eyes. He hoped that his daughter would keep the memories of those quiet evenings with her parents, and not about the upcoming difficulties. Wiping away his tears, he quietly went downstairs to where his wife was sleeping on the couch. He kissed her gently on the lips, and covered her with a blanket to keep her warm. He then went to look for her phone and found it charging on the bedside table in their bedroom. After unlocking his phone, he began to look through her text messages. It didn't take him long to find what he was looking for. Scrolling back, he traced their conversations over the past three months. He came across a message that caught his attention. Hello, pretty girl. It was fun watching you at the girls' dance last night, Luke wrote. Similarly, Bob works late on Thursdays, and the in-laws look after Casey, so we had a bachelorette party, she replied. Your husband seems like a good guy to let you have fun, he replied. Yes, he's wonderful, she confirmed. The messages remained friendly for a while, until one conversation stood out. Today, Vicky talked to me about our lunch breaks. I was annoyed, but she was right about everything. He agreed and said, that's right, I don't want any confusion. She noted, Vicky asked if Bob approved of our behavior, and it made me realize that we might be sending the wrong signal. I also think I shouldn't share all my problems with another guy. I have to talk to Bob about this. He reassured her by saying, I understand, but if you can't talk to him, you can always come to me. And I'll even invite you to dinner if you want, just as a friend. Bob didn't remember her trying to talk to him, but maybe that's when he realized he needed food-grade stainless steel for the project. He spent several days looking for a supplier who could provide the required quantity of products. At that moment, he was so focused that he would not have noticed if a bomb had exploded next to him. If you recall her messages, they all seemed harmless. It was quite clear to him that this fool was flirting with her. How can she be so inconsiderate? As he continued flipping through the page, he came across the next set of messages. She. You have to return them today. He. What are you talking about? She. You know perfectly well that my friends are mad at me, and I don't blame them. If Bob finds out that I've been acting inappropriately, he might leave me. He. So you don't want me to show him the video? 
She, I can't let anyone at work see this. He, Sam was present and recorded the video on his phone. I'll make sure he deletes it, but you owe me. She, okay, I can't lose Bob. Not after last night. He, what happened last night? She, it's none of your business. He, was he upset that you came home late and drunk? She, no, something happened that turned everything upside down. He, so dancing with me you asked your husband for forgiveness? She, you're disgusting. Last night was unforgettable because Bob and I love each other. Now give me back my underwear and make sure the video is erased. Damn, it sounded like I was some kind of slutty woman. Bob deserves better than me. He, no, he's lucky to have you. He looked out for you, didn't he? She, I don't need anyone to take care of me. Just be the friend you pretend to be and do what I asked you to do, please. He said, I'll help you, and then you'll buy me dinner. She replied, just make sure no one sees this video and I'll do whatever you ask. There was nothing else until last Monday. He, I heard that the bachelorette party was canceled. How about we have dinner together? She, this is not a good idea, I'm sorry. He, come on, your husband will be at work and the girls left you for one evening with a friend. We can meet in the cafeteria, just like in the good old days, and you owe me. She said, okay, I'll meet you at the Red Horse at eight. He, no, I'll meet you at the TGIF located at the Sheridan Hotel. They have great booze and I don't want to deal with drunken idiots. If we drink too much, I'll get a room. She, okay, but it's just dinner with a friend and I'm grateful to you that the video didn't come up. It's bad that they found out about it at work. He, Sam has already deleted the video and soon someone else will commit some scandalous act and distract attention. They agreed to meet at eight. Bob thought about it and realized that this could be the beginning of the end of his marriage. How many times has he seen his wife go on dates with other men in the hotel restaurant bar? How could this situation lead to a positive result? How could she not think about intimacy? Closing the messages on his phone, he plugged it into the charger, undressed, and climbed into bed alone. He couldn't sleep that night. When Thursday came, she came down the stairs in her little black dress, which she always wore when they went out together. She looked absolutely gorgeous. She noticed him sitting at the table and was surprised by his early arrival. I didn't expect you to come back so soon, baby, she said, her voice trembling. We need to talk, Sharon, he replied evenly. This conversation is extremely important. Please sit down. She sat up nervously and reached for his hand but he pulled it away. I know there won't be a bachelorette party today. I know you're dating Luke Jonas behind my back, he began. Let me explain. But he interrupted her by slamming his fist down on the table. Damn it, Sharon, listen to me, he shouted, his voice full of frustration. You can't talk until I'm done. Sharon recoiled, tears starting to form in her eyes. He looked at her coldly before continuing. I know you kissed that fool at lunch. I know you danced with him at the Red Horse Bar. I know that you even took off your underwear and gave it to him after a few seductive moves on the dance floor. I know that your sudden interest in me three weeks ago was caused by your excitement over him. Tonight, you have a date with him at the hotel bar, where your boyfriend has a table reserved. I do not know if you have already had an intimate relationship with him, and I do not know what can prevent you from doing this." He paused, trying to contain his anger. Sharon, you deceive me by hiding information about Luke your risky behavior, and going to your friends. To be honest, I'm devastated, and my faith in you is undermined. I'm not sure I want to save our marriage, and it looks like you're not aiming for it anymore either. That's why I'm offering you three options. He held up one finger. The first option is that you can leave and be with your lover. Even if you don't do anything tonight, this decision will mean the end of our marriage, and I won't want to save him. Then he held up a second finger. The second option. We've been sitting all evening while you're trying to convince me to make an effort to save our marriage. The task before you will not be easy, because it is difficult for me to trust everything you say. Despite this, I have a glimmer of hope, because my love for you and for our child is of great importance to me. I admit that there is a 50% chance that I will be able to try. Raising the third finger. Option three. You take me with you to meet your lover and demand in front of my eyes that he never speak or contact you. After that, you will give me the opportunity to talk to him alone, at least for 15 minutes, away from strangers. This gesture will show maximum respect and increase my willingness to cooperate with you. If you haven't had any intimate relations with him, then I guarantee that I will fully devote myself 
to making our relationship a success. But if you got intimate with him, then this may not be a chance to save our marriage. She looked like she was about to throw up and looked at him with an expression of pure horror. The question hung in the air for what seemed like an eternity. She seemed to be holding back the urge to vomit as she looked at him. Bob, I'm sorry for everything, and I really need to talk to you, she said urgently. As for your question, who will be driving you or me? He was stunned by her unexpected choice. He assumed that she would spend the whole evening trying to justify her actions. By agreeing to meet her lover, she earned a few points, but she was still deeply wounded. He took the keys and followed her to the car. Without hesitation, I opened the door for her, and she was on the verge of tears when I pulled out onto the road. She looked at him. I ruined everything, didn't I? She asked quietly. Yes, Sharon, you really messed up, Bob replied, focusing on the road. What can I do to fix this? She asked. He thought for a moment. He had several ideas in his head. Well, first of all, from now on, complete honesty. It goes without saying, but it seems like you think it's okay to withhold information that I need to know or constantly deceive me. Besides, you have to find a way to earn my trust. I don't know how you plan to do this, but to be honest, I didn't break the trust. There is one more point that, in my opinion, does not require clear wording, but still, I will say, it is no longer a part of your life. If we're going to continue our relationship, you shouldn't talk to him at work. You don't need to ask how his day went. If he ends up in the same bar as you, you need to leave. If you can't leave, contact me immediately. You refuse to accept drinks or gifts from him and completely stop all communication, no matter what he says. When we get back tonight, you'll tell me everything. I admit that I was too absorbed in this project and I will take on some of the responsibility. If you have any grudges against me, please express them. And finally, sign up for a marriage counseling session. If you want to choose a consultant yourself, don't be shy. Ron can recommend someone to you. After Bob finished speaking, a message suddenly came to her phone. She glanced at him quickly, and her face turned even paler. It's him, wondering where I am, she whispered softly. Bob held out his hand, and she handed him the phone. Without saying a word, he started scrolling through her text messages. There were several messages sent earlier that day. He, hi, I've booked a room with a jacuzzi. Maybe we can relax after lunch. Take a bikini with you. She, you can't get me drunk enough to take a hot bath with you. I'm not taking a bikini with me. He, we'll see. You know what happens when you drink. Maybe you won't need a bikini. The message followed. Where are you? While I was waiting for you, I decided to have a glass of wine. Bob replied, I'm a little late. I have a surprise for you. He, you must have brought a bikini with you. Bob returned the phone to his wife. She read the messages and just hung her head. You do realize that these messages won't help you in your case, right? Judging by today's messages, you have already planned to meet with him tonight. How much worse will it look if I scroll further? She asked, realizing how terrible it would be. I have to ask, Bob began. Do you think your messages today have crossed the line of inappropriate flirting? Can you understand that these conversations have completely destroyed my trust in you? He heard her crying. Bob, I swear, I just wanted to have dinner tonight. I never had any intention of sleeping with him. But Bob couldn't help but look at her in disbelief. Were you going to give him your underpants like you did a few weeks ago after you took them off? He didn't think she could get any paler. But it turned out that Bob was wrong. Sharon, we've almost reached our destination. You should touch up your makeup and prepare for what you're going to say to Luke. And please refrain from wine. She lowered the visor and took a napkin out of the glove compartment. Gathering her strength and wiping away her tears, she carefully applied mascara. In a calmer voice, she asked, Bob, I understand why you think Luke is playing games with me. When you brought it up, I realized that you were right. But Bob, how could I not have noticed that? Despite my recent decisions, which may indicate otherwise, I am not a naive girl. I've rejected more attractive and sophisticated men than Luke. So why did he choose me? That's one of the reasons I find it hard to believe what you're saying right now, Sharon. You are a beautiful, intelligent woman who should be able to see through this deception. Imagine if I picked up some woman in a bar and then lied to you that I was going to have dinner with her tonight. No wonder you feel so angry and resentful. Her complexion seemed to have returned to normal and her voice was a little stronger. Okay, I made a mistake and now I have to figure out how to fix it. Thank you for giving me another chance. 
She bent down to kiss her husband, but I turned my head at the last moment, allowing her to kiss his cheek. I won't get over this easily, not in the long run, Bob said. She looked at him in surprise. They are usually very affectionate. I hope we can work things out in the end. What should I tell him? She asked as they drove up to the restaurant and found a parking spot. Bob turned off the car and tried to contain his anger. What do I want you to tell him, Sharon? Our relationship is on edge because of what you did to that fool. You've destroyed the foundation of our marriage. Maybe our daughter will spend Thanksgiving with you and Christmas with me. I need you to understand this, so tell him whatever you think is necessary. After a moment of silence, she sighed and opened the car door. When they reached the restaurant and the hotel, she made a barely noticeable gesture, as if wanting to take her husband's hand. He didn't resist, but he didn't reciprocate either. When they entered the restaurant, the red-haired hostess greeted them from behind the counter and asked if we had booked a table together. Before Bob could answer, his wife intervened in the conversation, mentioning that they were dating someone who had already been here. The waitress confirmed her remark and offered to explore the area. Since Bob didn't know what this man looked like, he followed his wife. She gave her husband a gentle nudge and pointed towards the back of the restaurant, where a man was sitting at the door of the hotel, engrossed in his phone. With purposeful steps, she approached the table and stopped without sitting down. The man looked up, saw her, and smiled broadly. It was only when he noticed Bob standing behind her that his expression changed. The smile disappeared, and his eyes narrowed slightly. He's worried about our relationship, and I have to admit that after our conversation, I share his concerns. For the first time in our marriage, I gave him reason to doubt my loyalty. I am determined to correct the breach of trust that was caused by my association with you. I don't want to have any more contact with you. Please refrain from calling, texting, or any other contact with me. I take full responsibility for the current state of our relationship and have decided to put an end to it. My husband now knows about my unseemly actions at the Red Horse Bar. I intend to do everything possible to fix our relationship with him. I will report this whole situation to the Human Resources Department. Tomorrow I will tell them that any attempts to involve me in non-work-related conversations will be undesirable. While my husband is talking to you, I'll sit at the bar. Giving Bob a quick kiss on the cheek, she apologized softly, her eyes briefly meeting her husband's. When she left, Bob felt relieved. Surprisingly, the situation was resolved even better than he had hoped. When he sat down opposite the shy playboy, Bob couldn't help but appreciate him. With his dark hair, slender figure, and impeccable fashion sense, one could argue that he is attractive. But the ability to evaluate men has never been his strong suit. It was difficult to determine his height when he was sitting, but she caught his lingering gaze at the glass of wine in front of him, which only strengthened her suspicions. Bob needed to keep his composure and think about what to do. She had a rough idea of exactly what she wanted, but she would have to improvise as the conversation progressed. Bob was not a quick thinker. So you decided it would be a surprise to see her in a bikini? Bob said with a half smile. Do you really think she told you everything? He replied, grinning. Now that he was standing in front of Bob, Bob felt calm. It was a situation he could handle. Actually, yes. I've known her for 10 years and been married to her for 8 years. I think I understand her better than some cute guy who's been stalking her for 3 months now, Bob said, keeping a smile on her face. The waiter came up and asked if they could bring drinks. Bob asked for a double Johnny Walker Black on the rocks. She definitely knows how to please a man, he said with a grin. Luke looked at the glass of wine he had ordered for her. Yes, it's true this time, Bob replied, grinning broadly. But I don't think you're talking based on your experience. Luke was joking. Do you need photos? Then he laughed. Luke was trying to provoke Bob. Bob resisted the urge to reach across the table and instead just laughed. You don't have any photos. If she had gone that far with you, you wouldn't have had to put something in her drink. What do potential violators use these days? Bob's guess was confirmed by Luke's surprised reaction. He recoiled when Bob leaned closer to him at the table. Anger surged through him. You disgusting coward. I have to teach you a lesson right here and now, but I can't risk going too far. 
I don't want to end up in jail. I offered my wife three options and now I'm offering the same to you. Bob pointed a determined finger at him. First of all, you will leave immediately. You will apologize to my wife right now and quit your job tomorrow. I won't take revenge, but you have to leave the city. Secondly, admit to the police that you drugged my wife. You'll do your time and then you'll stay away from my wife. I'll keep an eye on you, but I won't touch you. I've signed us both up for boxing classes, which will start in four weeks. We will enter the ring, sign injury waivers, and not leave until we both run out of steam. And when you come to your senses, you'd better stay away from my wife. Then you will leave the city. While Bob was talking, the waiter brought his whiskey. Bob took a deep sip, feeling the warmth of the alcohol. It's time to collect my thoughts. You probably think I'm naive. Why would I agree to any of these options? Luke chuckled. Bob returned his grin with what he hoped was a menacing look. Because you don't want to spend the rest of your sad life constantly looking over your shoulder. Every time you walk to the car in the dark, you will be afraid that I or one of my accomplices is lurking nearby, ready to harm you. Every time you open the door, you won't be sure that I or one of my accomplices won't break in, detain you, and hurt you. When you go to the bar, you will be afraid that I or one of my friends will mix your drink and expose you to unspeakable actions before harming you. You won't take any chances. You're a coward. That's what your wife said after I met her last night. The color returned to his face as Bob took another sip of whiskey. He reached into his pocket and activated the voice recorder on his phone, hoping to record the conversation. Bob realized that he should have planned this evening better. You plan to drug my wife and attack her, you bastard. Are you willing to risk a lifetime of agony, assuming that I won't take action? It's time to confront Bob. The drugs were supposed to prepare her for the arrival of my friends. In a moment of desperation, Bob reached out and grabbed Luke by the collar, pulling him closer. Although he couldn't hit with full force while sitting, he still managed to hear a pleasant crunch when Luke's nose broke. Luke screamed, pinching his nose and threatening to call the police. Bob persistently persuaded him to call, calling him a fool and suggesting that the authorities check the wine in the glass and listen to the recording of his confession. Police arrived at the scene 10 minutes later, as two officers were nearby having lunch on the subway. They quickly recorded Bob's testimony and took the remaining wine and glass for analysis. During the search, a bag of white powder was found near the hatch. When Bob was asked to provide additional information, Luke asked for a lawyer and declined further conversation. Then the police listened to the recording I made, confiscating Bob's phone as evidence. The footage showed Luke discussing illegal drugs and a possible attack. It was almost four in the morning before Bob and Sharon were finally allowed to leave the police station after much thought. After her testimony, the officer praised Bobai for almost 15 minutes and emphasized how he had prevented the attack on his wife. By the time he finished, she was visibly shaken. Luke was still with the police. They used her phone to promptly report the situation to Bob's parents. They calmed them down and took care of Casey, deciding to take her to the zoo. After parking in the garage and turning off the car, the couple met eyes. She unbuckled her seatbelt and pulled Bob to her, hugging him tightly. After letting her cry on his shoulder for a while, Bob gently pulled her aside. Sharon, we still need to talk, but it's too late. Let's get some rest. Tomorrow we'll go to work and spend the day sorting things out. How do you like it? Yes, Bob, going to bed is great, she replied quietly. Can I sleep next to you? No, Bob said. The next morning, he woke up and saw her clinging to him. He allowed himself to believe that everything would get better in the end. Despite this, Bob understood that there were still several conversations to be held before making a decision. He understood that it was important not to rush things. Sitting up, Bob playfully patted her perfect buttocks before suggesting a walk. He didn't want to start a serious conversation on an empty stomach. Despite the temptation, Bob resisted until the problems were solved. The next morning, they had breakfast at the International Pancake House, discussing Casey and her upcoming visit to Bob's parents. The conversation was positive and easy. After finishing their coffee, they paid the bill and returned home. They sat down at the kitchen table and prepared to solve the problems that had arisen. I'll start, Bob said. I'm not going to talk about Luke's identity. You know who he is. He said that a few days ago you satisfied him and called me a wimp. Is that true? No she replied. The most negative communication with him was that ill-fated night at the Red Horse. I admit the seriousness of my behavior, 
but I didn't cross any boundaries. How can I trust you? Bob asked. You lied to me about a recent date with him and didn't reveal the details of that incident at the bar, not to mention your whole history with him. I found it necessary to be honest. I was thinking about it and I got an idea, Bob said. How about taking a lie detector test? She asked. You mean the lie detector test? And Bob confirmed it. She nodded. Yes, let's appoint him. You can ask me anything. Just tell me when and where. Her sincerity was obvious. Bob knows that these tests are not always accurate, but it will be easier for him if they are true. I'll see what I can arrange. It may take some time, but it's worth thinking about, he said. Actually, it may take longer than expected, Bob added. She smiled. This is a good starting point. We can consider the extent of your involvement later, but my next question will probably be the most difficult. This is what causes me the most pain and has the greatest impact on our relationship. How do we live on? The underwear incident confused me, and I understand that. I don't like it, but I understand. It's hard for me to accept that you got close to another guy without telling me about it. If you thought it was just a platonic friendship, I can sympathize with you. But what I can't understand, and what makes me pull away before I feel even more pain, is that you claimed to be dating your friends when you actually had dinner with him? This blatant lie, without thinking about the consequences, shattered me to pieces. When you mentioned that you were dating another man, it was heartbreaking. Bob remembered how tears welled up in his eyes. He felt completely helpless. Bob, all I can do is try to explain my thoughts at that moment. First of all, I want to apologize for offending you with my lies. When you decided to take on this project, I couldn't help but feel that I wasn't important to you. I want to make it clear that I don't blame you or your job for this. I know how important this project is to you. I just wanted to share my feelings that I was feeling at that moment. I started to feel bad and Vicky's sister made an offer that hooked me. She mentioned looking for romance elsewhere. I didn't want it to be perceived as cheating. While you were absorbed in the project, I began to realize that I could find what I was looking for elsewhere. And then Luke intervened. I didn't understand it at first, but he managed to make me feel like an important person. He showed genuine interest in my daily life, family, and hobbies, making our conversations mostly focused on me. While Bob was trying to hide his emotions, she was watching him. It wasn't until Vicky bumped into me during lunch that I realized my actions. I used Luke to fill the void that I thought I couldn't find with you, but I still wanted to establish a relationship with you. That evening, when everything got out of control, I didn't plan to invite him or his friends. They arrived before my friends, and Luke even bought drinks for everyone, including me. I found myself more intoxicated than ever before. I have made some regrettable decisions that you are aware of. But we also shared an amazing night together, which made me feel even more conflicted. How could I be so reckless with him and share such wonderful moments with you? She stood up and poured herself a glass of water, taking a few sips before speaking. Then a video appeared. I foresaw your anger and I understand why you are upset. If the situation had reversed and you were kissing another woman while intoxicated, I would have been furious too. And I knew it would be even worse because after our passionate meeting, you'd be wondering if I was thinking about someone else. Trying to hide my mistake, I attracted Luke. Feeling obligated, I agreed to go to dinner with him when my friends couldn't. I felt lonely, thinking that you wouldn't be home until late at night. In a moment of weakness, I made a terrible decision and I deeply regret it. Our relationship has always been based on trust and I destroyed it. Tears were streaming down her cheeks, but she remained calm. Bob knew she was hiding something. Oh my God, he muttered. We have not yet returned to what we were, but in time, we will be able to do it. If you are ready to devote yourself completely to this, then so am I. Bob and Sharon went to counseling together, and solving his problems was a turning point. The most important lesson for him is that he didn't really know the woman he once married. The consultant advised Sharon to take a lie detector test, and she agreed, although Bob saw uncertainty in her eyes. After taking a lie detector test, Bob realized that what his wife had told him was a lie. He knew he wanted to see the video that Luke had mentioned. Bob visited him in the hope of finding out the whole truth and seeing a video with his wife. The conversation with Luke was tense, and for honesty, Luke demanded that Bob withdraw the charges against him. Bob had no choice but to agree to Luke's terms. He understood that if he did not find out the whole truth about Shannon, he would not be able to trust her. On the same day, Bob received a video in the mail from Luke's friend, 
Opening it on his computer brought tears to Bob's eyes. Shannon, Luke, and two of his friends engaged in intimacy in a hotel room. The whole process was filmed on a phone camera. It was obvious that Shannon was drunk, but she did not mind what was happening. She enjoyed intimacy with three men. On the same day, Bob went to his office and replaced the locks and the bomb while Shannon was at work. Bob was furious at the act of the woman he had given his life to. He dreamed of revenge. He wanted her to suffer. While his daughter was with his parents, Bob posted an incriminating video on various adult websites, as well as published it on social networks. This is going to be a complete failure for Shannon. He had one desire to shield his daughter from all this, and he decided to leave the state in the near future with his daughter. With all this, Bob did not keep his promise to Luke. He did not withdraw his accusation at the police station. The following weeks were difficult for Bob as he implemented his plan to leave the state. While Shannon was crying bitterly at her parents' house, Bob and Casey left town. The divorce was finalized and Shannon was left without everything, without a husband, without a daughter, without a home, and without means of subsistence. During these few weeks, Bob managed to make himself bankrupt, sell his house, and leave his unfaithful wife in poverty. And Shannon had to decide for a long time how to live on because she was disgraced. Many friends and relatives saw about her intimacy with several men, not speaking from those people who were not personally familiar with her. Shannon understood that she had hurt her husband, but she did not understand how he could do this to her. Her life turned into chaos. She was fired from her job, and she couldn't get another job because of her reputation. Shannon's nerves were thin. She drank a lot and stayed out of the house until a terrible thing happened. Intoxicated, she drove her father's car to Vicky to say that she had brought her life into chaos. Shannon understood how Bob found out everything, but fate was not on her side. In an instant, Shannon's car twisted several times around itself. A terrible accident took her life. Bob and Casey stood over Shannon's grave and knew that she had come to this because of her own stupidity. Jeff, when I sat down at the table to express my feelings, I was overwhelmed by a variety of emotions. It was hard for me to break up with you, but I want you to know that it's not about pointing fingers or holding a grudge. It's about accepting the changes I've been through and being honest with both of us. Our time spent together was filled with happiness, which I will always cherish. From the very beginning of our joint journey to create a joint future, we have overcome difficulties together and enjoyed success. But in the middle of our daily routine, I somehow lost touch with my own personality. I want you to understand that my decision to take a step back is not a reflection of your value or our connection. It's just the realization that I need to reconnect with myself outside of our relationship. I was so focused on defining myself through our connection that I neglected my own aspirations and passions. I decided to leave you this letter because I believe that honesty is important in any relationship. I can't bear to see the pain in your eyes and hear the pain in your voice when I try to explain my feelings. It would be unfair to both of us to delay the inevitable, and I hope you can find understanding in your heart. I sincerely wish you only happiness and satisfaction in the future. You deserve to be with someone who can love you completely, without any reservations or hesitation. I hope that in the future we will be able to remember the time we spent together with love and gratitude for the lessons and memories we received. Please take care of yourself, Jeff. You will always hold a special place in my heart. I understand that what I'm about to say may seem selfish and hypocritical, but the truth is that it's selfishness. That's why I decided to leave. I crave the thrill of a new novel and the excitement of finding a new person, and unfortunately you can't provide that anymore. You were absolutely charming when you were young, whether it's playing guitar with Buddy in a band, riding your Harley in an elegant leather jacket, your blonde hair blowing in the wind as we danced. You even painted amazing portraits of me and our children. But over time, we began to feel comfortable in our relationship. The performances in the band have decreased, and you have started to devote more time to football. Now the Harley is gathering dust in the garage, hidden behind children's sports equipment and a minivan. My knees hurt too much to dance like they used to, but your beautiful hair still fascinates me. When our children have grown up, I no longer feel at home in that minivan that you chose. I want to clarify that I have never cheated on you, and you are still the only man I have ever loved romantically. 
but I can't deny that I'm attracted to other men. Before I made any decision, I realized that I had to break up with you. I couldn't bring myself to deceive you by acting surreptitiously. Jeff, my love for you is too strong for that. I believe that we will meet again, but I don't want to talk about it. I've talked to Sam, and he'll take care of our divorce. I completed all the necessary documents, took my clothes and personal belongings, leaving everything else to you. I agreed to share my pension with you and take on half of our debts, except for the mortgage because I think it's fair because I played a role in the occurrence of these debts. Please grieve in private so that we can avoid unnecessary drama at events with children. But I believe in justice, so if you want to answer, I promise to read carefully and respect your thoughts. With love, Ellen. I read the note over and over again, unable to move from the place in the kitchen where I found it. The tears didn't flow. My emotions were too blunted to let them flow. There were no warnings preceding this moment, no hints of discontent or unfulfilled desires, no signs of the presence of a third person in her life. We shared moments of intimacy, affection, and happiness, all the actions of a couple building a life together. I spent the last year trying to win her back when our youngest child left for college. I bought her jewelry, but she scolded me for spending too much. Instead, she preferred chocolate. I stopped striving for physical intimacy with her, believing that by initiating intimacy, I was causing her stress. She told me that just holding hands is enough. Maybe she was making hints, but I ignored them, thinking that she was just getting used to age. And so I realized it for the last time. I took a beer and went to the shower at the same time. After finishing one serving, I took two more and went to the shower, not caring that I would leave the water on the floor. I drank purposefully, intending to finish my stock, although I usually save beer, as wine lovers save their wines. Although my beer collection has not thinned much, but if it had happened, I would have switched to wines. Despite this, I definitely felt the effects of my drinking the next morning when I woke up with a piercing headache lying naked on the floor after a shower. After I went upstairs, I threw up, climbed into bed and cried. When I was 11, my grandmother died. At her wake and funeral, my grandfather took me aside and said some wise words. He told me that I have three days to mourn the loss, and just as God raises the dead in three days, I can resurrect my own life. He advised me to cry, scream, vent my frustration. When I got older, he said I could drink, fight and pray. It is important to allow yourself these actions before moving forward. Moving forward, I honored the memory of the departed. A person does not fixate on the past that he has lost, but focuses on the present that he is forming and on the future that he is moving towards. He liked his grandfather's words. After his wife left him, he initially took it as the end of their marriage. He cried, drank a lot and vented his emotions, smashing furniture and walls with his fists. He screamed, kicked, and drank more than he ate, believing that beer and wine could replace food because they were made from grain, fruit, and water. In his opinion, all his food groups were reduced to two bottles. During my summer vacation, she decided to leave after waiting for the end of the school year. She chose a strategic time. The following Tuesday, I woke up feeling unwell. The first thing I did was call my kids. Ellen had already informed them of her decision and they were trying to contact me urgently. I was too drunk to answer, but I made sure to let them know that I was okay. After that, I started cleaning the house and assigned a truck to donate to a charity. I wasn't going to keep reminders of my failed marriage. I decided to leave only the furniture, which is a family heirloom, to pack photos and albums for children. The rest of the items, like the silly trinkets, I threw into the trash without hesitation. Spanish ceramics and brass cats from Portugal were of no sentimental value to me. I went to the Home Depot and bought floor coverings, carpet, paint, and new panels to renovate the house and make it my own. The pink and coral walls and frilly curtains have disappeared. I went to Sam to finalize the divorce papers because everything was indisputable and only one lawyer was involved in the case. The lawyer said that most likely, everything will be completed by about the time school starts again. I decided to sell the minivan and switch to a Triumph Spitfire convertible fulfilling my long-held dream. The car was British racing green with beige leather upholstery and chrome wire wheels. After clearing the garage of unnecessary things, unpacking the Harley was a piece of cake. One of the most important decisions I've ever made was contacting my friend Buddy. 
This decision changed my life as quickly as my wife's resignation letter. 30 minutes after I told Buddy about my situation, he and our group of friends were at my door. Buddy has been my closest friend since I was a kid. We started a band together, played sports together, studied together, and even went on double dates. He was my best man, and I was his. The end of my marriage was a catastrophic event for him, and he did not allow me to cope with problems in my personal life on my own. Although our band broke up many years ago due to life difficulties, our loyal fans have not forgotten us. When I talk about Buddy and the rest of the guys, I don't just mean a handful of guys. We performed at numerous events such as weddings, funerals, parties, and picnics, often providing our music at discounted prices or for free because we appreciated the community that supported us at every concert. It seemed that our good deeds caused a ripple effect, inspiring others to do good deeds. Rumors that I was remodeling my house to truly reflect my personal style spread quickly, prompting an outpouring of generosity. Over the next two weeks, many skilled workers, painters, carpenters, bricklayers, plumbers, and others came together to not only renovate my walls, but also completely transform my house inside and out. The Workers Association seems to have attracted the attention of women to them. Their wives and girlfriends began to come to observe the repairs. Soon they began to bring their unmarried girlfriends with them, which led to the creation of the frivolous project, Jeff's Love Life. No one tried to aggressively set me up with someone because it was too early for that. But it was obvious that people were subtly trying to play matchmaking. Soon I was going dancing several times a week. Spontaneous barbecues and gatherings began to take place at my house, and I always had friends. Despite the fact that I was not ready to enter into a new relationship until my divorce was finalized. Buddy offered to revive the band and he has already arranged for performances in familiar clubs. No sooner had my walls dried from a fresh coat of paint, Buddy and I returned, performing on Fridays at Jimmy's and on Saturdays at a dance club downtown. On Sundays, we performed a duet at a popular seafood restaurant on the waterfront. It seemed like we never stopped playing together because we were all at similar stages of life. Our children have grown up and become independent. We were all dressed to impress with hairstyles except for Ronnie, our drummer. We didn't waste any time. We went on stage in full force, filling the halls every evening. Sometimes my sons would drop by to help with the repairs and even play with the band. I convinced them that they shouldn't tell my mom anything about me and be honest if she asks. They said dad was upset at first, but now he's developed and thriving. My daughter, who lives in Australia with her fiancé, was given the same instructions. I fully believe that my children would respect my wishes, and I believed them when they promised that Ellen did not know about my condition. To overcome the feeling of loneliness, I focused on developing positive habits, improving nutrition, and increasing physical activity. I had always taken care of myself, but now I was enthusiastic about training, whether it was swimming or cycling with a new determination. Every night before the performance, I practiced paying special attention to my legs or upper body. In just a month after Ellen's departure, I was able to rebuild my home, my social life, my daily routine, my connection with my children, and my appearance. It seemed appropriate to reply to her letter since she had started the conversation. Dear Ellen, you were right. Goodbye, Jeff. I sent her an email brief containing everything I needed. I didn't look for her new address and I didn't want to. There were rumors about her. It was whispered that she had a young man in a fancy car and with gentle manners. They were seen together in coastal clubs and on beaches. I politely declined any news about her life. But in the circle of our mutual friends, these fragments formed the story of a fast and intense romance that lasted from September to June, or maybe even from October to June or from November to May. Nevertheless, none of this bothered me. I sincerely hoped for her happiness. Following my grandfather's advice to wait three days before making a decision, I was happy with who I had turned into. I was too caught up in my current self to dwell on the past, on what we once had. The end of summer became a melancholic reality for teachers like me, but August was full of exciting musical possibilities. This year was the same as all the previous ones. Throughout September, Buddy and I were busy at festivals that took place one after the other. On Labor Day, we performed several times a day. With such a hectic schedule, I didn't have time to check her email response. It wasn't on purpose. I just decided that our conversation should be short 
and to the point in order to end everything the way she wanted. I was too preoccupied with the events in my life to worry about email. I almost forgot about the problems of my marriage until Sam called and informed me that our divorce was moving fast. It turned out that the clerk familiar with the family court judge was a fan of our group, and by Friday, I would officially become a bachelor. After a month and a half of growth and change, Friday was supposed to be my return to bachelor life. We were scheduled to perform at a local art festival and street fair, and suddenly all the attractive women in revealing outfits were within my reach. It's exciting. When we went on stage, the crowded street came to life. We turned on the amps at full power and let loose our energetic blues music. From cover versions to originals and spontaneous jams, we made the audience dance. It was an exciting experience. Digging through old recordings, the guys found long forgotten recordings from previous years. We didn't have the opportunity to record an album then, but now we had enough material for a couple of improvised albums. Maybe our life situation had hindered us before, but now we were making up for lost time. Making CDs was a simpler process compared to vinyl, and our compilation of classic and modern compositions was a success with customers. Women of all ages cast interested glances at me, hinting that my dry period was about to end. In all the excitement, I didn't notice Ellen trying to get backstage. I casually put the guitar on the back seat of my motorcycle, which was originally designed for convenient transportation of guitars. Without realizing it, I didn't notice how Helen hurriedly approached me and how her expression changed when she saw Michelle, a busty blonde in her 30s, sitting behind me on a motorcycle. For the first time in the 25 years that I've owned a motorcycle, someone else got on the seat. As I drove away from Ellen, I wished I could see tears in her eyes. Michelle was truly amazing. I will not describe the details of our meeting and the intensity of our physical connection. I'll just say that I've been chasing her relentlessly all night. When I returned with the energy of a teenager and reached a level of pleasure that I had not experienced in many years, I left her completely exhausted. When we said goodbye that evening, she politely advised me not to call again, perhaps worried about the consequences of our passionate meeting. I realized that I couldn't avoid seeing Ellen forever, and I was right. Our paths crossed again at our usual Friday night place, Jimmy's. She came with her new partner and another couple, sat down at a table and ordered drinks. When I saw her in the audience, I quickly signaled to the band that we needed to change the set list. Whenever we noticed an ex-girlfriend in the crowd, we had a tradition of playing American Woman, with the offended guy taking on the role of vocalist. This was how we expressed support for our friend. We had a strict rule that dating a friend's ex was strictly forbidden, and we never crossed that line. When I started playing the guitar riff in the soulful style made famous by Lenny Kravitz's cover of this song, I realized that I was enjoying American Woman like never before. When I sang the lyrics and poured out my soul in guitar solos, the crowd was stirred up and fired up with energy. I was so focused on the performance that I didn't notice Ellen's reaction when she realized that the song was about her, but Buddy's wife noticed everything. She later told me that Ellen's face was haggard and tears appeared in her eyes when I sang lines like stay away from me and go on and let me be, giving free reign to my emotions. While her companion and friend stayed at the party, enjoying drinks and dancing late into the night, problems were clearly brewing in paradise. A week later, my eldest son visited me with interesting news. It turned out that Ellen and her young boyfriend had a fight that evening. He was tired of her charm, and she was trying her best to keep up with his energetic lifestyle, both physically and in other ways. He expressed his displeasure that Ellen avoids the places where we perform. He heard rumors that my band is performing again and is gathering large crowds at our concerts. To his horror, he found out that Ellen had given up her share of our property in the divorce and was going to move into her house. I had suspected him of being a gold digger before, but his audacity shocked me. He didn't seem to know about the prenuptial agreement that Ellen's father had entered into to protect her from any ulterior motives on the part of a potential spouse. I agreed to this agreement voluntarily because I didn't want to cause her any harm. The agreement stated that if one of us decides to end the marriage in search of a better life, he will lose all rights to the family property, which in this case will belong exclusively to another person. Apparently, Ellen knew about this agreement 
which could be the reason why she proposed a peaceful settlement of the divorce. After breaking up with her young partner, Ellen spent the next night in tears, pouring out her soul to her children on the phone. I felt sorry for her, but I had already finished grieving about my failed marriage, and now I could provide support without experiencing personal worries. But my children were unhappy with my detached approach. They still considered me uninvolved and believed that I should allow their mother to temporarily return to our house to help her recover. I didn't agree because I didn't want to deal with the mood swings associated with menopause that I had already experienced during our marriage. Besides, besides having to deal with her feeling rejected by the previous boyfriend, the thought of her crawling up to me in humiliation, perhaps feeling guilty for leaving at all, was not something I wanted to face every day. Over time, the children's demands for help became more reasonable, and eventually I allowed them access to the warehouse, which I rented for our furniture and things too valuable to throw away, until Ellen found herself a small apartment. I went so far as to lend them the group's truck to help with the move. With the start of the new school year and the busy schedule of the group, I found that I rarely saw Ellen. Despite the fact that we both taught in the same area, we worked in different school buildings, which led to infrequent meetings. And when we did cross paths, I hardly paid any attention to her. I unwittingly became a popular target for rumors, probably due to the fact that I was often seen on my Harley or in a sports car. Perhaps because of my busy schedule or my newfound bachelor status, the rumors didn't bother me much. The band was doing well, my epic barbecue parties were a hit, and I always had female company. I was absolutely happy and didn't miss my marriage at all. Finally, my dream came true. I flew to France for Thanksgiving, coinciding with the release of Beaujolais Nouveau, and it became the highlight of my year. This year, Thanksgiving came earlier than usual, which allowed us to build the calendar correctly. While preparing for the trip, I was surprised when my son called me the night before and asked me to join him for Thanksgiving dinner at Ellen's restaurant. He was disappointed when I told him that I already had plans, but quickly switched his attention and suggested spending a family Christmas instead. He and his girlfriend volunteered to cook, and I took over the organization of the holiday. He said that all three children will come to the city, and he hopes that they will remember this day especially. I agreed to the Christmas get-togethers, but on the condition that Ellen would know that she was not allowed to bring a couple, and that I would focus on the children. Later, my son told me that Ellen doesn't date and feels lonely. Despite this revelation, I did not become more interested in her romantic life. My main task was to have a quiet family meeting without the possible awkwardness associated with a new romantic relationship. I invited them to stay at my house as long as they wanted, wanting all the children to be together and not in a hotel. My son was worried that Ellen might feel left out if she left and everyone else stayed. After thinking about it, I realized that this meeting would be the first time our whole family could be together since the children left. I said Ellen should be part of the family. Invite her to stay too, I told my son. But she'll have to sleep in the guest room because I don't think she should stay in her old room. If you bring guests, they will either have to stay in your room or look for accommodation elsewhere. Thank you very much, it means a lot to all of us, my son replied gratefully. Christmas that year fell on a Saturday, so the celebration began on Thursday evening when everyone arrived. My daughter and her fiancé flew in from Australia, and my son and his girlfriend flew in from Boston, taking my youngest, who went to college there. Ellen arrived about ten minutes before them, and I noticed that she was sitting in the car and nervously watching everyone gather in the yard, hugging and kissing each other. A feeling of nostalgia came over me for the first time since I came out of three days of mourning. When the six of them finally entered the house through the front door, they were greeted by a cozy and welcoming atmosphere. It dawned on me that neither my daughter nor my ex-wife had been in the house since I renovated it, so their return was greeted with amazement. I decorated the house with Christmas decorations, as we always did. The space was filled with candles, nutcrackers, which were now placed on my new furniture. The Christmas tree, decorated with old holiday decorations and crafts made by children's hands, stood proudly in its usual place. After a fireplace appeared in the house during the renovation, its warm light complemented the cozy atmosphere. The aroma of mulled wine filled the room, and plates of cookies and fudge were scattered on all surfaces. 
The table was set with exquisite porcelain that Ellen's grandmother had given her for her wedding many years ago. It was obvious that I had made our house my own, and now it was fully ready to welcome my family for Christmas. Despite everything that had happened, there was no denying that they were still my family. Even though the children were already adults, they were still my flesh and blood. They caused a feeling of delight when they explored the house. I redesigned the children's bedrooms so that they look like in the original, making small changes, for example, replacing the bright pink color in my daughter's room with a more subdued pastel. After rearranging the old single beds into cozy double beds, I kept the children's desks and dressers, but added new headboards to them. The spacious guest room turned into a studio with a drawing table by the window for drawing and a large space for musical instruments, amplifiers, and recording equipment. One side of the ground floor has been expanded, turning a small library into a spacious room with a TV and a billiard table. The living room was neatly arranged around a new fireplace, which was now decorated with fresh Christmas socks, one for each of us, including Ellen. The sight of stockings instantly evoked nostalgic memories in children. With playful smiles, they rushed to their socks, as if time had suddenly turned back and they were innocent children again, enthusiastically welcoming the festive season. Older siblings showing signs of maturity also grabbed their partner's socks, sharing pleasant memories with each of them. It has always been our custom to carefully fill stockings with simple gifts and goodies before moving on to the big gifts under the tree. There was laughter and the crunch of wrappers in the air as they ate cookies and chocolate, put on stupid socks and enjoyed the magic of Christmas morning. Dad, your sock is empty, they apologized. We didn't know, so we didn't bring anything to fill it. I took my sock from the fireplace and looked inside. No, my dears, you filled it up. You are all here sharing memories, laughter and joy. Now you're filling it with the Christmas spirit. You fill it with love hugging and kissing each other. We exchanged Christmas greetings, and Ellen stayed in our arms a little longer than expected, creating a feeling of warmth and unity in our family. Children eagerly opened presents under the tree, reliving the joy of children's Christmas holidays. After exchanging gifts and enjoying a festive feast, we gathered for a traditional Christmas jam session with guitars in our hands. The evening continued, and eventually we began to disperse to our bedrooms, filled with contentment and a festive mood. Reaching for her coat in the hall closet, Ellen expressed her gratitude. Thank you for being so kind to me today. I'm very glad that I spent Christmas with you and the children, she said. After reflecting on her past decisions, she added, I know it's my own fault, but of all the things I've given up, I miss family time the most. I acknowledged the bittersweet reality of our situation and said, Although the children have grown up and live independently, these meetings would be just as rare even if we were still together. Ellen nodded in understanding. But I also miss the quality time we spent together. Do you remember when we were just the two of us as a couple? Now I want to apologize to you. I understand that I made a mistake that prevented us from living a wonderful life together. Don't be hard on yourself. We've always taught our children to chase dreams and seek happiness, and that's exactly what you did. Maybe we have different lives now, but they are still full-fledged. She looked at me with disbelief. Are you saying that after today, you don't feel nostalgia or regret for what we've lost? Ellen, we had a wonderful day together, but what have we lost? We've lost each other. I've lost you, and I will never forgive myself for that. You didn't seem to care. When I put my arm around her shoulders, tears flowed from her eyes, and she finally broke down. I was already crying when she arrived, but seeing her like this on Christmas Day was very sad. She was concerned about how fast our relationship was progressing and felt she needed time to figure out if she was really ready for a long-term commitment. I shared with her the pain I felt when she left and told her that I couldn't be with a man who wasn't completely committed to our relationship. I told him that it took me a while to heal after the breakup of our marriage, but I came out of it ready for a new life. Today she plays a wonderful role in my life, and I am grateful to her for that. I kept my composure, comforting her through tears, and suggested she stay the night. I made a bed for her in the studio, gave her one of my t-shirts and a bathrobe. After making sure the house was safe, I went back upstairs and heard her crying, doubting she would be able to sleep. 
Despite this, I fell asleep without difficulty. The next day was like a special holiday, and Ellen was very happy when we invited her to stay the whole weekend. We avoided talking about our past in front of the children, but I couldn't help but notice the familiar expressions from our marriage in Ellen's eyes. There was an unmistakable, I love you so much and those wonderful smiles that I remembered so well. I even responded to several silent requests to hug and kiss me. It felt like we had a mutual understanding like in a marriage. During the meal, she poured coffee and I added milk. I was buttering the pancakes and she was pouring the perfect amount of maple syrup. We finished each other's sentences without difficulty. Despite such closeness, we slept in separate rooms. When the kids went on a trip, leaving my daughter to explore Boston with the boys and then ski in Vermont, Ellen and I were left alone in our shared home. While she was opening a bottle of wine, I was lighting a fire. We sat together, chatting and laughing, until our conversation turned into a serious plane. I made mistakes, behaved stupidly and ugly. I know I'll never be able to completely fix what I've done, and I don't expect you to forgive me, but I want to apologize. I hope that we can at least be friends again. You weren't just a husband to me. You were my best friend, my confidant, my partner. I really miss every part of you. When I smiled at her, tears began to flow. Ellen spoke with great eloquence about her journey into boredom, admitting that she had unwittingly pushed me away, creating an impassive void from which we both suffered. She spoke in detail about how excited she was to meet a charming young man and how she was tempted to enter into a secret relationship. She admitted that she demonized me to justify her actions, portraying me as a villain while she behaved monstrously. Her story alternated between delight at betrayal and disappointment that I did not fight for her, looked at her indifferently and let her go. She admitted that she envies my life after I quickly returned to the lifestyle before the relationship, especially when she sees another woman in the backseat of my Harley. Her jealousy turned to anger when she saw me with different women, each of whom, in her opinion, offered something better than what she had. Her emotions hit rock bottom after the divorce, when she found out that her young lover had a habit of dating married women until they became lonely, and then dumped them. He was happy to spend their husband's money. After his father, a traditionalist who disapproved of his son's habit of having affairs, disowned him and deprived him of trust funds. After the breakup, she struggled to find another man. It seemed that suitable men of her age were either already busy or unwilling to devote themselves to a woman who had cheated on her faithful first husband. Although there were many men willing to buy her a drink, dance with her, or spend the night with her, there were no long-term options. Young people found her attractive for dating because she remained attractive and charming. But they did not want to enter into a long-term relationship with a woman going through menopause because it made it difficult to start a family. I patiently listened to her displeasure until she said everything she wanted to say. Then I poured us both another glass of wine and handed her mine with an encouraging smile. From what you've shared with me, it follows that you've made some questionable decisions, but you don't owe me anything. Like I said, you got what you wanted, and I loved you enough to let you go. I regret that I could not capture her reaction at that moment. It was obvious that she did not expect that my feelings for her would be the reason for my forgiveness. I quickly forgave you. How could I force you to stay married when you didn't want to be there anymore? I knew I couldn't control or limit you, if I tried to forbid you to do something, you would just do it in secret. Although your note may have seemed harsh at first, but looking back, it helped simplify the situation for both of us. We managed to avoid disagreements on property and custody issues, since our children have already grown up. I am grateful to you for that. Although I am no longer your husband, it may take some time before you begin to perceive me as a close friend or confidant. Trust is something that is difficult for me to handle. But if you are willing to trust my advice, then this is your choice. Calling each other partners in crime is probably too sentimental right now, so maybe we'll just call ourselves friends. Tears filled her eyes as she hugged me. She made the decision to stay one more night, but decided not to dwell on it. We slept in separate rooms as we had a lot of catching up to do. It felt like we were easily returning to the role of joint parents. The next day, she returned to her home to prepare for a New Year's trip to the children in Boston. I had concerts scheduled for the whole week because it's a busy time for musicians. It allowed me to focus on the music and not think about Ellen. 
Since the new academic semester started after the new year, there wasn't much time left in my schedule to see her. Our paths crossed again at a professional development conference in April, where we sat at the same table during lunch. During our delightful conversation, we discussed our daughter's upcoming wedding in Australia, and it seemed to me that we were returning to the role of friends. When our lunch came to an end, she thanked me for treating her well, both that day and at Christmas, and expressed her joy that we could move on as friends. Before saying goodbye, she asked me for a favor. Blushing and hesitating a little, she finally managed to mention that she had asked to ride a Harley on one of the Saturdays. Encouraged, I agreed, noting that the forecast for Sunday promised warm and beautiful weather without any prior commitments. I suggested heading north, having a leisurely lunch and getting some fresh air. Her face lit up with joy and nostalgia, as memories of her youth on the back seat of my motorcycle flooded in. Those days always ended with passionate moments when she clung to me for hours as we drove, her hands wandering over my chest, and the rest you can imagine without unnecessary details. She often joked that on the next trip we would go for a ride with something powerful between our legs, and the bike was not bad. I wasn't sure I could resist her playful charms, and as it turned out I couldn't. As we drove to the waterfall, I felt her exploring me with her hands. After climbing to the top and driving through the forest, we stopped in a charming town to stroll through the streets and look into antique shops. Although I usually didn't like it, talking to this woman, whom I always thought was beautiful in every sense gave me pleasure. Our lunch was very tasty, and by lunchtime we returned to the south and stopped at a charming marina to have seafood dinner. By candlelight, delicious food and the soft sound of waves hitting the pier, it became clear that a special evening was waiting for her. I brought her to my house, to our house, and we shared our bed for the first time. Yes, we made love. It seemed like we were both playing the role of lovers now. The following week, we continued our dinner and movie dates and shared intimate moments again. We also had dinner together several times, but we didn't touch on the topic of defining our relationship. The idea that we should be the only ones did not occur to us. My daughter's wedding was approaching, we had carefully thought out every detail, and I gladly and without hesitation took care of all the expenses. In addition, the band earned good money by performing at festivals. Before the divorce, we managed to pay off the mortgage and minimize credit card debts. I had a reliable, well-paid job, and I had no one else to support, so I was in a comfortable financial position and had savings in the bank. The only thing we didn't discuss was our travel plans. It turned out that we had both agreed on a separate trip but by coincidence we stayed at the same hotel. After comparing the records, we found that we had booked the same flight. I asked her to come to my place so that we could ride together in the car that I rented for the trip to the airport. On the day of our departure, Ellen showed up ahead of schedule. I was still tidying up after breakfast when I heard a car pull up to the entrance. The driver quickly took us to JFK Airport. Dropping our bags on the side of the road, we walked together to the terminal. The check-in area was sparsely populated, so we were able to queue together for our flight to Sydney from JFK Airport. After Ellen walked forward, the attendant asked why I hadn't chosen a shorter queue reserved for first-class passengers. Despite the fact that I bought a first-class ticket for a long flight, I usually use more economical fares and was unaware of the benefits such as express check-in. The ticket agent laughed at my mistake and directed me to the first-class waiting room. Ellen was already there, and we went through the security system together, and then headed to the gym. When I checked in at the counter, the clerk did not ask that Ellen had an economy class ticket, but offered to transfer her to first class so that we could sit together. Call me sentimental if you want, but there was something wrong with flying halfway around the world with my daughter's mother to attend her wedding in first class, while she had to squeeze into the cabin with no legroom. When we boarded the plane in rows, I made her wait with me. At first she was annoyed and worried that her seat was given to a standing passenger and began to fuss. I smoothed over her annoyance by mentioning that I had already checked her into the waiting room upon arrival. The persistent irritation disappeared when she sat next to me in first grade. Her mood changed so dramatically that I briefly thought about joining the Mile High Club. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. I don't indulge in public displays of affection especially in the cramped space of an airplane toilet. Our arrival in Sydney marked the beginning of a magical week. We went on an excursion, 
visited different places, and most importantly, witnessed my daughter starting her own path to marriage. I can't tell you how proud I felt when I said mom and I agree, leading her down the aisle and marrying her off. During the reception, I had the honor to accompany Ellen and enjoy the traditional dances. One of the highlights of the evening was that her brothers and I and the orchestra performed the rousing composition, All American Girl, our musical tribute to our beloved daughter. After the celebration, Ellen, the boys and I gathered in the living room of the hotel. One of the boys got straight to the point. So what happened between you two? Nothing new, honey, Ellen replied. Your dad and I just completely accepted our role as your parents. We have left the past behind and are enjoying life. Do you mind? Yes, mom, it just seems to me that something more is happening, said one of the sons. It seems that you've become closer again. Maybe you're even thinking about getting back together, Ellen sighed. Some time ago, I had a moment of madness and I made a stupid mistake. I admit I was stupid, extremely stupid. I take responsibility for this and am ready to take responsibility for the consequences. Your father and I have already talked about this and his words are true. As we've always taught you, I have made a choice, ended the relationship, and am ready to face the consequences. The boys looked at me to get my opinion. I had nothing to add, and I sat with a smile, enjoying a delicious local Australian beer. Come on, Dad, Mom answered the question. Are you going to share your thoughts with us? Boys, we should appreciate the fact that we didn't spend a week exchanging hurtful comments with each other. I have heard that this is a common occurrence for divorced couples at such events. Besides, it seems to me that your question mainly concerns my personal life, which I consider private. Didn't I teach you not to share intimate details? So why should I do this now? But Dad, it's clear to all of us that you still love Mom. We're old enough to understand when a girl says she just wants to be friends without going into details that may cause discomfort. Could you confirm that you and your mother have a loving relationship? Son, given our shared past, our bond will always be more than just friendship. She is my love, the mother of my children and my closest confidant. Our connection has deep roots and defies simple definition. As for the future, only time will tell how our story will develop. After chatting a little more, we decided to go to our rooms. As soon as I changed into my pajamas, there was a knock on the door. It was Ellen. I invited her in, and we both climbed into bed. She was grateful for the upgrade and started thanking me for the amazing week we had. She appreciated how we worked together on our daughter's wedding and what I said to the boys in the living room. Overwhelmed by her gratitude, I could barely keep up with her sincere words. She stayed for breakfast, which I ordered in the room. The trip home seemed surreal. When we arrived at my house, Ellen kissed me on the lips before leaving. I want you to know that I will always be there for you when you need me, she said softly. Somewhere in the middle of my adult life, I lost track of why I fell in love with you. In the monotony of everyday life, I forgot how much you mean to me. Leaving you was a serious mistake. I've let go of the most valuable thing I've ever had. I will always regret hurting you, and I would like to go back in time to change everything. Whatever you need, just tell me. Do you need a tennis partner? I'm here. Do you need a tour player, a band, or a vocalist? Count on me. Need a lover? I'm your woman. It doesn't matter if it's making love. I'll be there for you. Do I need to cook a meal? Consider that everything is ready. I'll clean up, fold the laundry, wash the dishes, and wash the windows. I will never ask for or expect exclusivity. I know I've given up on it. Just know that if you need anything, the answer will always be yes. Do you see me as a friend, girlfriend, lover, lover or wife? Just tell me. I appreciate you for who you are. You're really amazing. And if you ever decide to dedicate yourself to someone else, I'll be there to remind her how lucky she is to have you and make sure you're happy. Thank you for the kind words, Ellen. I am grateful that we have reunited and are spending time together. I'm not ready to define our relationship, but I'm glad that I'm on this journey with you, even if it's only part of the time. I have spent my whole life surrounded by women, following their desires. From my mom and sister to marrying you right after college, I've always lived in a space where their preferences dictated everything. But now I've come to love my house, where I can choose the colors and the level of clutter. I like to cook food to my liking and have my favorite foods in the fridge. 
Being in a group brings me joy, and I have found that openness in intimate relationships is good for me. I'm not going to change that anytime soon. Do you remember the note I wrote in response to your letter? You accepted my comments, expressed your gratitude, and said goodbye. You didn't sign it with love. I really meant every word in that note. You were right when you said that we are stagnant and need to change. The words of gratitude and farewell were sincere. Adding any mention of love would be forced and inappropriate. Any other words I might have said might have seemed angry or desperate. I'm not like that. I said what needed to be said and now it's time to move on. Is there anything else you want to say? Nothing. I've already shown you everything you wanted to see. Yes, you showed me that you care. You've shown me that you still find me attractive and desirable. You have shown your love for me and your devotion to our family. You support me when it comes to our children. You show me a love that goes beyond the love of a casual lover by sharing meals with me and arranging dates together. You respect me and value our relationship so much that you treat me with the utmost generosity, for example, transporting me to first class and without hesitation paying the expenses for our daughter's wedding. You confess to our sons that I am the love of your life. The only thing that seems to be missing is a more committed role, like the role of a wife. I want you to know that I recognize and respect this, and I will never pressure you on this issue. I offered this commitment from the very beginning, but please know that if you ever decide to ask, my answer will be positive in advance, and I will pray every day for the opportunity to say it. With that, she kissed me goodnight. I've been thinking about her words, but let's face it. I may be in love, but why settle for just one thing? I had everything I could ever dream of. A cozy home, grown-up children, financial stability, an ex-wife still pining for me. A healthy body with a shock of hair, a thriving music career, a motorcycle, and a constant stream of women claiming my attention. Although I cared about Ellen, the idea of living with her in old age did not seem attractive to me at the moment. I may reconsider my views when I turn 60, but for now, I'm happy with my current lifestyle. I've already forgiven her, fixed everything, and my life is back to normal. So I decided to dial the number of the voluptuous blonde who joined me on the Harley after the street festival that marked my first affair after the divorce. She laughed when I asked if she really didn't want to hear from me anymore. After confirming that she didn't mind meeting, she sent me an invitation. When I got into the Harley to go to her, I knew that one day, I would propose to Ellen again, but that day was not today. I believe that many stories usually start from the beginning, but in this case, in my opinion, it would be more effective to start from the end. So, here I am sitting in a waffle cafe at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Two tables away from me, the girls are sitting and gossiping about their boss again. Right in front of me, three girls are trying to get enough of breakfast, and Hardy's waitress has just filled my cup with yellow liquid. Suddenly, a shadow loom over me. Well, Max, I say with a fair amount of sarcasm in my voice, I've been waiting for you to come, Max. Max is Maxwell Carnes, my former father-in-law. Hi, Chris, can we have a chat? It has been more than three years since I met this man and for the first time I felt that he appreciated me not only for the fact that I was confident in myself and could control everything, it was something I needed to hear and see. Please sit down, Max, you're bothering people. And he sat down opposite me. When Max sat down next to me, the girls looked at us in surprise. Max has always been famous for his strength, both physical and mental. He had the largest warehouse in the area and the only shipping company for miles around. When the local economy collapsed 15 years ago, Max managed to stay afloat, providing jobs and security for many residents of the area. At six feet six inches tall, he still commanded respect and looked like a man who had won a major role. When Max sat down across from me, I noticed that he looked stern. His unshaven face and dark circles under his eyes were a clear sign that he was having a hard time. Karn's house must have been depressing to him. Chris, I know it's not easy for you right now, but could you and Kelly forget about this little incident? At the word incident, my heart started pounding wildly, but I bit my tongue and remained silent. Max was not a man to be trifled with. My palms were wet with sweat as I resisted the temptation to punch the man sitting across from me. 
It took me a while to pull myself together and suppress the anger bubbling inside me, reminding myself that my goal was not to get into a physical altercation, but to come out of it victorious. Gradually calming down, I noticed that the people around us were trying their best to pretend they weren't eavesdropping. But deep down, I knew they couldn't wait to find out the juicy details. So why not pamper them? Okay, Max, which aspect of the situation would you rather I ignore? I asked in a calm but assertive tone. This was not a one-time event. It's been going on for years, Max, and you know it. Let's be honest, Max, she's been flirting with him for years. If you want to know the whole story, then here it is. I took my cookie and bit into it. From the moment we met and I asked her for her phone number, she started bragging about all the men who showed interest in her. Why, Max? Why did she behave like that? She tried to push you away, Chris, but you overpowered her and... I interrupted him by spreading apple jam on toast. She was testing me to see if I would fight for her and I foolishly did it. I gave her the attention she craved. I took another bite of the cookie and continued. And then she brought me home to meet her father and even then, you despised me. You didn't like my political beliefs, you despised my profession, criticized my sense of style and generally all my qualities. At first I thought you were pretending, but it became clear that you just didn't approve of me. I didn't meet your beloved daughter's standards. I continued to eat, enjoying the delicious jam. Max tried to answer something, unable to refute my arguments. I was aware of my shortcomings, but I was willing to put up with them. I tried to prove to you that I'm a good person, but it didn't work out. Instead of arguing with you, it's better to just accept what you're saying without saying or doing anything. Because of this, there were conflicts between us. You were constantly trying to insult me. Do you remember how you humiliated me? No, you don't remember that. I didn't mind. I just wanted us to remain one. Have you ever thought about her intentions? Have you ever wondered what she was trying to do? After taking a long sip of my drink, I took the opportunity to observe Max closely. He seemed surprised by my reaction. He wanted to see me upset and broken to save my marriage, begging and crying as a sign of humility. That was his plan. And do you know what happened next? She started spending time with her ex-boyfriends, claiming they were just friends. I raised my hand so that Max wouldn't immediately defend her. I knew that she had never cheated in the past. I assure you, after I chastised Thomas for touching her inappropriately in the bar, everyone insisted that nothing had happened. She was just checking on me, wanting to know if I would be jealous of her past lovers. In the end, it led to our breakup, but those three months were the best of my life. I finished the cookies and wiped my hands. Max was silent, and I didn't know if he realized that she wasn't as innocent as he thought. Or maybe he knew about it all the time, and my position finally worked. Anyway, his silence had an effect. I foolishly let her convince me to come back, thinking that everything would be fine when she started coming home earlier to spend more time with me. Everything seemed to be going well, very well indeed, but then I made the mistake of proposing to her without really understanding why I did it. I won a ring in a jewelry contest without paying much attention to it, but at that moment, everything took a strange turn. Suddenly, I was surrounded by a crowd of attractive women wherever I went, to work, to the gym, shopping. And although it was common for beautiful girls to approach me, it crossed all boundaries when they all started trying to seduce me, invite me to dinner and openly express their interest in me. Even Leanne, from whom I did not expect this in any way, joined the game. One day it came to the point that she locked us in the pantry and unbuttoned her dress. She was naked and I could hardly resist the urge to look at her. I was shocked to see the same girls at the wedding. These were her friends, relatives, and old acquaintances. Leanne even apologized, saying they wanted to make sure I wasn't cheating on Kelly. I checked it out, didn't I? But then, on the day of the wedding, I had to go through another ordeal when you handed me the prenuptial agreement. If I let myself cheat on Kelly, I won't get anything. Interestingly, there was no word on what would happen if she cheated on me. I asked about such a scenario. Will I be able to walk away unscathed? You asked your lawyer to clarify, if Kelly changes, I will receive $12,000 in my bank account. It's not a bad revelation, is it, Max? I keep my clothes, my car, and a small house that I inherited from my grandparents. And I signed this prenuptial agreement, remember, Max? And do you know what happened last Saturday? 
First of all, I had to work eight hours because someone decided to go to an amusement park instead of coming to work. It made my day terrible, but it was just the beginning. And so, I finally came home, Max. I couldn't park my car at the entrance. I had to park on the street because someone took my place. Have I thought about it a lot? Well, yes, but not in that sense. I thought one of the neighbors had parked there and Kelly still hadn't told them to move the car. So when I got home and saw Kelly's car in the driveway, I asked where she was. Kelly, I called. I'm at home in the bedroom, she replied. I was completely stunned when I walked into the room and saw Kelly and another man in the same bed, in our bed, in my bed. I was shocked for a moment before I finally screamed, what's going on? It may seem silly, but at that moment my mind was racing. My wife cheated on me, but I couldn't accept it. She tried to explain, darling, I love you, but I need more than what you give me. Don't worry, I'll be with you anyway. It's just a physical connection and has nothing to do with our relationship. I couldn't believe what I heard. This guy is lying happy. He's with my wife, and she's just grumbling like nothing terrible happened while I'm burning with anger. And then she takes another step forward. Darling, could you get us something to drink? It brought me out of my stupor, I tell you. Do you want me to get you both a drink? She was smiling, sweetly asking me to bring something from my beer supply. I snapped, if you're thirsty, go get your damn drink, you dirty woman. She grumbled, don't talk to me like that. I replied, shut up if you want, go and get it yourself. Do you remember our agreement before the wedding? No cheating. She hesitated. But, I interrupted, you'll get what you want, just not from me. You'll have everything you need in this big house, but not from me either. Don't come near me, idiot. Otherwise, both of you will eat exclusively through a straw for the rest of your lives, I said when I saw that he got out of bed. I've never seen anyone stoop like that before. Go to hell, you despicable man. You can have the damn house. I'm leaving, I shouted. And who did I run into in the hallway with her brother, Mike? What kind of dysfunctional family do you have? Mike wanted to help his sister so much. Calm down, Chris. It's not like you. Why are you even here? It doesn't matter. I'm leaving. Step aside. When I tried to walk past him, he stupidly grabbed my arm. You know, Max, I can't stand Mike. So when he touched me, I immediately took action. Did he get the satisfaction he was looking for? One blow was enough. I was tempted to punch him in the jaw, but instead I hit him in the neck. Believe me, a blow to the throat will knock anyone down. Then I went to my room, picked up my hiking backpack, and headed for the door. I needed gear for the trip. Chris, by the way, according to the doctors... Mike's condition improves after your physical impact. You did not spare him, Max said after listening to me for a long time. Great, but really, who cares? While I was talking, I was absentmindedly playing with my toast. Oh yeah, where was I? Kelly ran out of the house as I was leaving. Her robe felt open and she was screaming, but I ignored her and left. I had nowhere to stay, but fortunately my old house was vacant after a recent renovation. I have not yet found a tenant who would rent a house. I found the perfect place to stay overnight on Sunday. The next day I returned to the house to pick up my things. I parked the car and went to the door to get in. The house was empty, and I assumed that everyone had gone to church. I quickly packed up my clothes and necessary things, and then loaded the cot into the truck. Sleeping on the floor was too uncomfortable. After drinking a sip of water, I heard laughter not far from me. When I got to the truck, your daughter met me. I quickly got into the car and drove away without talking to her. When she drove up to her house, I heard Kelly running out of the car, furiously shouting my name. She probably beat me to it by taking a shortcut. But I didn't stop. I entered the house, ignoring her request to talk. She was knocking on the door, desperately trying to explain herself, but I had already made up my mind. She betrayed me by finding me in our bed with another man. I had nothing more to say. I decided not to confront her when she knocked on the door. I called the police, and I slipped out the back door and put on my headphones while reading a magazine. As soon as I saw the headlights of the police car, I opened the door for them and they ordered her to leave the house. They escorted her out despite the fact that if anyone else had done the same they would have ended up in prison. But she is your daughter, so they acted differently. Max awkwardly expressed his gratitude to Hardy when she put a cup of coffee in front of him. It was an unusual environment for him. He was usually in charge, always making decisions. But now I was leading him, 
holding the reins tightly in my hands. On Monday, I withdrew $12,000 from my bank account and closed all our shared credit cards, although I had never actually used them. I also took the initiative and scheduled an interview at S&K. They've been trying to convince me to expand the company for a long time, but I resisted because Kelly thought it was too risky. But when I approached them myself, they presented me with a convincing offer, which I eventually accepted. Then I plucked up the courage and informed my boss, Tom, of my decision to leave. He looked genuinely concerned and asked me why. I explained that although he was a great boss, I didn't go to college to become a clerk. I'm sorry that I had to leave you in a difficult situation, but I just found out about my wife's infidelity and I have to leave. Can you talk to Kelly about this? I really don't want that. Is there any way I can convince you to stay? He asked. I'm sorry, Tom, but I can't be persuaded anymore. Thank you for everything. As I was leaving the office, I noticed that his scheming secretary was talking on the phone, probably sharing what she had accidentally overheard. Determined, I went to meet Mrs. Hines. I heard that you need help with the divorce process. I hope Kelly doesn't get the paperwork at work on Tuesday. As a result, they tried to convince me to talk to her all day yesterday and today after the papers were handed over, but I decided to just leave. I believe your team was following me and noticed my car. Do you think you can intervene in my situation with Kelly? So, Max, would you like to explain that little incident? Was she having fun with someone else in our bed? Max, why did she betray me? I only had the first option. I had to leave them in our bed. Well, she would have liked that. The increased desire to make love could be satisfied. The second option is to join them. The excitement of the chase is to make her want you so much that she won't be able to resist. But Kelly was never interested in small gestures, work calls, dinners, gifts. She considered them a waste of time and money. I think she could get back at me for something I didn't do. I didn't cheat on her. Maybe she found out about the bachelor party and wanted revenge because I spent the night comforting Stacy and Mike's friends. But why did she cheat on me and how was she going to fix it? I did my best to satisfy her emotional and physical needs, so why did the betrayal happen? Maybe this is another test to determine my true feelings for her, or did I just want to get money from her to support her edible flower shop? Perhaps she wanted to check if I would find out about her infidelity if I would react violently or run away. Mike's presence could have been aimed at preventing me from hurting someone or running away so that she could eventually express her happiness from our relationship. Now she knows that my love for her is sincere. If all I needed was money, I wouldn't care if she was dating someone else. But I'm not like that. I've never played this game, Max. I've been putting up with your family and all the difficulties associated with it for years. But what did I get in return? Trust, love, respect. No, I came home and found that she was trying to manipulate me again. Max, it's time to wake up. Is there anything left that can save our marriage? I know that Kelly really loves you. He almost begged. Does she love me, Max? I'm exhausted, really. The door of the Waffle Cafe opened and I couldn't take it anymore. I do not know what you have done, Max, to raise your daughter like this, but I can't take it anymore. She will never change. She needs a man who constantly proves that he needs her, and I can't do that anymore. She pushed me to the limit. I loved her, Max, but she ruined everything. I hope you're happy now, I said, getting up. Max didn't budge. When I heard my last words, I saw Kelly standing at the counter. She must have been the last to enter. Our eyes met, and I saw tears in her eyes a tremor in her chin, but I didn't feel anything. I left a $20 bill on the table, put on my jacket, and went out.